So whenever you have at least two of these parts compromised, you're going to have an unstable ankle that is going to need a surgery. And I'm saying this because myself and probably some of the surgeons who are connected tonight uh, today are um, familiar with the concept that the decision was made on the displacement of the fibula. And we used to um, consider the two millimeter displacement as a limit uh, in order to indicate a surgery. That's not longer true. It has been uh, published many times. One specific uh, report was made by Nick van Dyke. And if you have even more than two millimeters displacement at the fibula, but the medial side is intact, uh, you do not have a rupture of the ring on two sites, and that fracture is going to be completely stable and will not need a surgery. And how do you know that? Because the displacement is not going to happen. So this is what you're actually looking for in, or, in order to be sure that the fracture is going to be um, considered stable or unstable. On the left-hand side, you see how... Uh, a normal ankle looks like with, with a Shenton, Shenton circle or a dime sign like the Americans used to call this. The tip of the fibula is related with this round line with the lateral process of the talus. The whole, synthesis, this, the whole area of the, the mortis in the ankle needs to be absolutely even, symmetrical. The medial side should be about the same uh, distance as the uh, uh, articular surface. There's another uh, subtle sign that most of the time the fibula has this shape that matches perfectly with the joint line. So on the other side, if you lose the Shenton line or the dime sign, or if you see that the fibula is shortened, uh, besides, you can see that the medial space may be open, not in this drawing, but it may be open. The, this drawing on the right-hand side will prove that the fracture is unstable. One important thing to consider is that not everyone is the same. So most of us would consider that this uh, space between the tibia and the fibula is absolutely abnormal, uh, but that's that's not true because it has been described that about 1% of the people does not have any fibular overlap. And the way to know that is just as simple as to take an x-ray of the contralateral side. So if both sides look the same, that's, that's a normal, that's a normal syndesmotic and a normal ankle. So uh, in this case, the fracture was treated with surgery and you see the medial space, the space is not open, but the syndesmosis was not closed because it was not needed to be closed because that was normal. So once you have the diagnosis, you need to think about to reduce the fracture. And we typically think that we use some device, a screw or a flexible fixation and we're done. And look at this case, the screw was placed you may say that the position of the screw is probably okay. The size of the screw is probably okay. The alignment and everything looks fine, except for the fact that the reduction was not done at all. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a screw that is in its position, but not doing anything actually is doing harm because you see that the, 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 the joint is open on the medial side, is open at the syndesmosis, the fibula is shortened and rotated. And this, uh, this guy actually ended up with valgus deformity and arthritis at the ankle. Look at this other example. You take a look at this fracture and you, you may think that the fibula was properly reduced and that you are missing the syndesmotic fixation and maybe something on the medial side. And then you go ahead with that simple thinking and you put the screw in and you repair the medial side and this is a complete disaster because reduction was not properly done and you need to go all the way back to the 
uh, lengthening and rotation of the fibula even before you proceed with reduction of the syndesmosis and repair of the medial side. So this is completely wrong. Another example with a Weber C ankle fracture, you can uh, imagine that the mechanism went all inside the joint through the interosseous membrane and came up at this level of the fibula with the fracture. And uh, this is a severe fracture with dislocation at the ankle. So you try to fix everything with a screw and it looks kind of okay, but it's not, it's not okay because you're missing a few things. One of the most important things that you're missing in this case is the posterior malleolar fracture. So if you not, do not reduce the posterior malleolus, uh, the syndesmosis is not going to be in, in its anatomical position. So the chances that everything is wrong are very high. And it may look kind of okay here, but it's not okay. I can assure you if you take a CT scan of this ankle, it's completely mal reduced. And it's going to end, this is exactly the same case with, with arthritis. Even if you're fool enough to think that removing the screw will fix everything. Uh, some people may think that in some cases you're going to uh, commit a mistake if you use just one fixation. And in this case, two fixations were done, but the fixations were put in, but reduction was not achieved. So again, the fixation you're going to use needs to be properly positioned, but once you have reduced the syndesmosis. Otherwise, uh, as we all know, and this is something that is absolutely certain, is that if you do not come up come out with a normal alignment of the ankle, you're going to have bad prognosis with arthritis. So once you have treated your fibula, like in this case, you need to test the syndesmosis anyhow. You can rotate the, the externally rotate the foot in order to apply stress to the syndesmosis. And if it opens, like in this case, you will surely need to fix the syndesmosis. If uh, you're not sure about this uh, stress test, you should use something else like uh, an osteotome or something like that and apply all the strength that you need to make sure that that syndesmosis is stable. And if it is not, you need to reduce and fix it. So. Sometimes you have the diagnosis before the surgery, but in some cases, once you're in the surgery, you need to do all the maneuvers that are needed in order to be absolutely sure that you're going to need or not need a fixation. Because as we're going to see later on, uh, fixation is not for free, not only from the expenses point of view, it's only from the complication point of view, because if you fix the syndesmosis, you're going to provide some stiffness in the, in the ankle. So what has been recommended is that you should reduce the syndesmosis with a clamp. And this clamp should be precisely positioned in the center of the fibula and in the center of the tibia. If you put it wrong, it will probably translate the fibula anterior, posterior, or it will probably rotate the fibula. And then fixation is done in the same axis of the syndesmosis. That's why we typically recommend to go in about 30 degrees related to the ground, the floor, or the operating table. Or you can rotate 30 degrees the leg in order to be parallel to the, to the table if you want. But no matter how you do it, you need to be in the axis of the syndesmosis. Uh, of course, this clamp damages a little bit the skin, so I prefer a clamp like this that is round and big enough to go around and you put it in the proper position. 
has been described, and this is a very hot topic recently in, in, in ankle fracture, that even if you do all this, you may end up with malreduction at the syndesmosis when you get a CT scan, even if your x-rays look okay. And malreduction is defined by displacement of more than uh, two millimeters anterior or posterior, or an angulation at the level of the joint of more than five degrees. Of course, these two cases are grossly mal reduced. This is another example of a tibia that was fixed with the plate and looks kind of okay. Uh, and then a syndesmotic screw, probably in the in an adequate position, but it was mal reduced. And in a case like this, it was grossly mal reduced. It was absolutely mal mal displaced. So you can try and insist, and you should always do this, to position your clamp in the center of the fibula and the center of the tibia and position your screw in the same axis of the fibula and that's the most important part to do in some cases if you have done every reduction properly and anatomical and that includes the posterior malleolus the fibula and the medial side sometimes it's in this mosis come back to its position spontaneously and you do not need to apply the excessive force with a clamp so a clamp may be absolutely necessary, but in some cases it may not be necessary. If you have, if you are lucky enough, like we, that we have a CT scan that we can bring into the OR, you can double check that your reduction is okay. But if you do not have it, and that's probably the um, the situation that most people would have, you always need to think that if you have a mal reduction after surgery and you get a CT scan, you're going to go back to the OR and how can you be absolutely sure that everything is going to come out okay if you did it wrong the first time. So you need to come back to the, to the principles and reduce everything properly, including everything, the fibula, the medial side and posterior malleolus, and then reduce the syndesmosis nicely and gently. Gentle. If you use a clamp, the clamp should never be uh, using the maximum strength possible. If you are, you need maximum strength in the clamp to reduce the syndesmosis, there is something that is probably wrong. So this is a correct reduction. And I'm going to show you, uh, this is a chronic ankle instability. So we are going to compare this with a See how unstable is the fibula, tibia up there, talus down here. Uh, if you go on the medial side, you can put your 4.0 scope inside and you can go all the way down to the medial side and see the, the rest of the deltoid. And sometimes you can see the tip of the medial malleolus that is nude. And after reconstruction of the ligaments and repair, you you come to a normal situation this is a normal relationship relation between the tibia the fibula and the talus and then we're going to see an acute injury so you will be able to compare another point in discussion when you uh, try to reduce the syndesmosis is the position of the of the ankle i learned to put it in dorsiflexion that makes a lot of sense of course since the talus is wider anterior than posterior but then everyone used to say that it doesn't matter what position the ankle is in because all you need to do and make sure that the, the syndesmosis is properly reduced but a recent article from 2016 again emphasized that if you uh, forget about the position of the ankle you may get everything in the wrong position so even if you do not insist in excessive dorsiflexion, at least try to keep your ankle in neutral when you reduce and when you fix the syndesmosis. So once you have dealt with the problem of the reduction, you need to decide about the fixation. And the classical fixation has been screws and it works fine in most cases. And there is, there is some discussion in the literature if you, if you should use one or two, 
it probably depends on the type of instability. Um, severe instability, when you are looking at the fibula while putting the plate in, is when the fibula is moving spontaneously from dorsal, I mean, to back to anterior, posterior to anterior. That for me is a severe instability, is a rotation instability, is sagittal instability, and that ankle will probably need more than one fixation. The position of the, the screw, uh, people say two, four millimeters. The fundamentals for that decision is that you do not want to be inside the syndesmotic because if you are in the, in the joint, you may end up with uh, calcifications. So you want to be exactly above. If you're too far away from the syndesmotic, your power to reduce and maintain correction is worse, is less. So you, that's why you need to be between two and four centimeters from the joint line. But if it is two, three, or four, it depends on the size of the syndesmosis. If you use 3.5 or 4.5, it seems to make no difference. You probably should choose whatever suits better to your patient. If you use tricortical or four cortices, depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, mostly, uh, it is recommended to use tricortical because the fixation is not too stiff. So you allow that construct to uh, loosen by itself. Compression is not recommended. You should put it in, into a normal position and do not over compress. Removal is another point of discussion. Uh, in some cases, if you keep it uh, and you do not remove, people will, ex will experience some, some uh, problems when dorsiflexion uh, is trying to be achieved. Uh, and they typically complain at about three to four months. And then we're going to talk about flexible fixation, which is another hot topic uh, to go through. Do we need to fix every Weber C fracture? This is, you could, we can discuss if it is a Weber B or Weber C, but in this particular case, once you reduce the fibula, the syndesmosis was okay. So you didn't need to use fixation of the syndesmosis. This is a case in which the screw was placed at the level of the syndesmosis, what we were talking about. It should be above, just above the syndesmotic level to prevent ossification that causes some botherness. The screw should be in the plate. If the plate is using the whole length of the fibula, most of the time you will have to put the screw in the plate. But in some cases, if you use a posterolateral plate or, or, or a more anterior plate, you may have to use the screw outside of the plate, even if it is at the same level. Sometimes the plate is more proximal and the screw is distal. And of course, sometimes, you, sometimes when you're not fixing the fibula, you may use just screws to fix it. And this brings us to another point of discussion, which is uh, how high do you go into the fibula to fix it directly? Most authors would recommend to directly reduce and fix the fibula in order to achieve proper length and reduction. But of course, most of us would not fix this very proximal mesonef fracture because you're very near to the perineal common nerve and the likelihood of an injury is very high. But some people would even do fixation here, but very few surgeons would dare to do it. So I would not recommend it. Most people would fix and reduce the distal half of the fibula. The proximal half, you would not, and you will reduce uh, the syndesmotic distally. Uh, take a look at this case, a fracture with some shortening and rotation. And in this case, uh, fixation directly, fixation of the direct fixation of the fibula, and then distal fixation of the syndesmosis was achieved. Uh, you may sometimes decide to use a plate to put your fixation in order to avoid the stress that is applied 
with the screws or with the flexible fixation into one specific point of the fibula. So I think when, you're, when you think that you have a very unstable syndesmosis, uh, a plate with a, with a two fixation is better because you um, control some of the stress that distributes all over the plate compared to one single point where you're putting your fixation. Going back to the point of the three or four cortices, if you use four cortices, this is going to be very stiff and it will not loosen by itself. You will need to take out the screws. But in some cases, like when you have neuropathy or diabetes, you may increase your fixation in order to make this like a super construct to prevent recurrences uh, and loosening of your fixation. Uh, Coming back to the point of if you would remove the screws, I remember that it was recommended to always remove a screw between uh, six or eight weeks after the surgery, but some people would, would experience displacement. So right now it's recommended to keep it at least three to four, and some people would say five months. And then people typically do not have any complaints that you, not, you don't need to remove any screws. Uh, what typically happens is most of the screws around three months, as I told you, they break or they loosen, showing this kind of windshield effect around the screw and they do not have any complaint. Some people will not experience this and they will complain of some limited dorsiflexion around three to four months. And those are the cases in which I would recommend to remove the fixation. That's one of the problems of a rigid stiff fixation like a screw. Um, and right now, as I told you, most people like Stefan Rammel would recommend not to remove the screws on a regular basis. Um, see, in this case, the screw broke by itself. And even if you have some complaints around the head of the screw, you can just remove that part and, and the rest is not a problem. And Part of the problems that you have with the screws, like prominence that need sometimes to be achieved removing the screws, that means another surgery. The, the issue that in some cases you need to remove the screw, the issue that the screw may be too stiff are probably uh, compensated when you choose a flexible fixation like this one. And I think most of the surgeons are moving into this type of fixation that can be used by itself or through the plate, like in this case. And if you take a look at the literature, reduction with a flexible fixation seems to be better compared with the screws. Uh, Reoperation rate seems to be less with flexible fixation. And uh, functional outcomes seem to be better. So that means that patients, they seem to feel better and they seem to recover quicker and easier, especially athletes. The technique is very simple. You just use a needle to pass the bottom into the medial side and then you tighten. Uh, when, when, as I told you before, when the, you have the sensation that the fibula is osteoporotic too thin, or if this is severe and stable, I would recommend to use two fixations, always using a plate to distribute the stress. And if you're using two flexible fixation, they should be divergent like in 30 degrees to better control rotation. So the fact that then right now these flexible fixations are not less are very, um, very welcome because one issue at the beginning of this uh, uh, technique, we had some issues with irritation around the knot of this flexible fixation. This is a, a drawing showing the 30 degrees divergent construct that is recommended when you use two fixations. What is not so good about this flexible fixation is that it doesn't control uh, the length of the fibula. So if you have a high fracture and you need to use flexible fixation, like in this case, you may use a clamp, hold the distal fibula, correct 
the length, correct rotation, and then fix the length with the screw. And then in the other hole of a plate, use a flexible fixation. At the beginning, this construct may look awkward, but it has one advantage because some people say, why not using two screws if you already put one? The thing is that you may, you may achieve, achieve uh, the length, you may achieve reduction with the, um, using the, the flexible fixation, but you keep the length. And if you do not use a second screw, the construct is not so stiff. So this screw is probably going to loosen by itself and you will not need to remove. And uh, the, the, uh, when you avoid removal of a screw, that prevents a second surgery, saves a lot of money, and that's something that the patient likes. So flexible fixation has the advantage that you rarely need to remove the flexible fixation, and that's a big advantage compared to uh, the rigid fixation. Look at this uh, male, big one, more than 100 kilos, in this case, the syndesmosis was very unstable, as you can see from the CT scan image. This is a case I borrowed from my friend from Argentina, Alberto Macklin. And look how interesting. He did everything. He fixed the chaput fragment. He fixed the syndesmosis. He fixed the medial side. And at the end, everything was unstable. This fixation was done many years ago. And curiously enough, I had like three similar cases, even in young people. And I was so curious that after doing everything properly, I still saw something unstable and I needed to add a very uh, indecent and not elegant K wire holding the fracture. Uh, everything turns out okay, but we were wondering what was wrong in this patient and once you have done everything properly, there is something else to consider, which is the anterior tibiofibular ligament, the inferior part. It's, it's hard to, to put some stitches because it's very flimsy, that uh, ligament. But if you, if you see that the, the syndesmosis is very unstable, it's, very recommended, it's well recommended to do it. But in some cases when it is too flimsy, you can use uh, a, a tape uh, to, to fix it uh, instead of putting some sutures like in this case. And uh, this is specific plate. Uh, you may even add this, uh, this internal ligament supplementation even through the plate. So you don't need to add a second hole in the fibula and other advantages of all these options that you have. Uh, another thing to discuss, as I mentioned before, if you need to repair the medial side, the, the Duke group, they recommended to repair the medial side. And if you repair the medial side, they say that you will never need to fix the syndesmosis. I think that may be right, but the, the fixation of the deltoid is probably not too strong. And that's the reason why uh, we typically recommend to fix the syndesmosis. And if the syndesmosis uh, is okay, and then the deltoid is not, then you fix the deltoid. I would not trust just a deltoid reconstruction without fixing the syndesmosis. Uh, another thing you need to consider is the posterior malleolus. Right now, everyone is familiar that when you have this kind of posterior malleolar fracture, you need to fix with a direct approach, proper anatomical reduction with the plate, and that corrects the Foldman fracture that is attached with the ligaments that goes into the posterior aspect of the syndesmosis. So when you do this properly, the fibula, the posterior malleolus, the syndesmosis come back to its position by itself. And let me show you a case. Uh, this is a professional Chilean soccer player that had this injury. Uh, if you take a closer look, it was a severe rotational injury. They, they call me telling me that he had a fibula fracture. But when you take a look at the fibula fracture, you immediately realize that this is not a fibula fracture because it has a medial open uh, space. The syndesmosis is wide open under uh, wavering CT. So this is uh, 
uh, an arthroscopy of an, this, this acute case pushing the fibula. You see how unstable it is. The tibia is up there. This is again the fibula, the talus, the tibia up there. And you see how unstable the, the syndesmosis is. You can put your shaver inside the tibia fibula area without any problem and that is completely abnormal. Uh, you see that the talus is displaced with the fibula laterally compared with the tibia. You will see how, how it, it looks completely different after fixation. Then in this uh, image right here, we are testing the syndesmotic with the, with the probe and it's the same unstable situation. Then we go into the medial side and you will see that the medial side again is wide open. You can put your 4.0 scope inside and then, then if you keep going down, you see some hematoma, of course, that's the lateral part of the talus. You keep going down the, the, the medial malleolus, and the medial malleolus has no deltoid attachment at all, just some fibers of the deep deltoid. So that proves that the medial side is unstable, and that uh, allows us to decide, because the, the fracture was high, we decided to um, use this double fixation in 30 degrees, repair the medial side, and we were able to prove or at least show that the tibia and the talus are in line and there is no space into the tibia fibula area. So this is another way in which you can prove yourself during the surgery that the syndesmosis is well reduced. If you try to, if you try to get into the medial side, now the medial side is tight enough you cannot put your, your arthroscope in there. So in general terms, you need to make a, a pre-op diagnosis and then uh, test the syndesmosis intraoperatively. And the final decision is made after fixing the lateral, the medial and the posterior malleolar. I surely and definitely prefer flexible fixation for most of my cases, even if you consider that it's more expensive that a simple screw, uh, cost effective at the end is less expensive because you prevent uh, or you decrease the likelihood of new surgeries. I would recommend to use two of them in severe instability or in heavy athletes uh, and add a plate to decrease the stress at the area. And if you need to maintain the length because the fibula is shortened, I would surely add a screw uh, to, to it. Um, and a final picture, just, just to remind you guys that we moved our uh, world meeting of the IFAS to the end of February, uh, April next year, 2020 in Chile. Hopefully we can all meet if the health conditions allow it. Thank you, my friends. And I, the Professor Rajiv, what would you use for an eclectic syndesmotic injury Mal, mal union of an ankle. The, I like that question. Thank you, Rajiv, dear friend. He's a, he's a fantastic surgeon, and he has been in these situations probably just as like a, like I am. I I, I have been in that situation. Uh, what I think right now is you should always try to reconstruct a mal united ankle unless you have severe arthritis. So if that is the case, you need to redo the malunion of the fibula, the malunion of the posterior malleolus, and then go back to the syndesmosis. You will typically need to remove the scar tissue in order to put the syndesmosis in the proper position. And then I will fix it just the same as I would have done it at the beginning. Even if the, the patient is six or up to eight months after the surgery. And I took this, uh, this advice from Mark Myerson, always reconstruct a mal united ankle because the other options that you have, an ankle replacement or effusions are not so good. And even if you, uh, are, your option would be an ankle replacement or effusion, once yet you have your ankle in proper position with a good reduction, then you need to, um, then you, you will need, uh, it would be much easier to do a prosthesis. Ronald from, from Argentina, thank you, my friend, is asking if I would recommend to do a, a fixation, a fusion of the syndesmosis. In general terms, I would not, but when you use rigid, stiff, and very 
uh, stiff construct, most of the time you will it will end up with a rigid stiffness scar, stiff scar, or with a fusion by itself. I will re rarely try to fuse it directly. I have done it in cases when I have removed a, a bone tumor like an osteochondroma. Uh, Nas Nasef is asking, is there over tensioning of the syndesmosis? Uh, also, how to use fluoroscopy and reassure that the syndesmosis is adequate, uh, is properly reduced. Um, I think it's rare to over reduce the syndesmosis, so that's a very good question, but it has been described some cases that end up with a lot of calcification, pain, some arthritis signs. So that's why I would never recommend to uh, put over tension in your clamp. Um, and fluoroscopy, you need to use all, uh, all the angles, AP, lateral, oblique, and everything to make sure that your fixation is in the axis of the syndesmosis to decrease the chances of a malreduction. And if you're already opening the fibula, please look directly at the, at the syndesmosis. If you are not sure, an arthroscopy is another uh, useful uh, option. Uh, Rajiv is saying that he typically use four, uses four cortices and 3.5 screws plus a, camp, a clamp, which I think is, 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 is probably okay. Uh, and Rajiv, uh, two screws. Ah, this, this is good. Rajiv is, is emphasizing that for revisions or delayed presented malunited cases, he will recommend two screws. I completely agree with you, Rajiv. Uh, if, if you're doing a case that has more than whatever, four or six weeks, uh, I would use two fixations for sure. And another important thing, uh, I think in, in, in a revision case or in a malunited or an eclectic case, I would use screws. That's very important, uh, Rajiv. I forgot to mention that. Thank you, my friend, for reminding. In ligaments, this only syndesmotic injury. Do you treat conservatively? Uh, I, I think uh, we have three, uh, three uh, classification with three options. One, you have a syndesmotic injury that will not open even under a stress. Second, second case, the syndesmosis is not open spontaneously, but you apply a stress and it will open. Case number three, the syndesmosis is wide open in, a, in an AP view, uh, with any, without any stress, um, case number three and case number number two, I will treat them operatively for sure. The only case I will not do surgery is the case that has a partial injury of the syndesmosis that doesn't open under stress. We are going to talk now about uh, ankle instability. Is I like this topic very much and how to improve recovery time and the use of internal ligament augmentation. The, the ankle ligament injuries, we're used to think about uh, lateral injuries, but you need to consider that sometimes you may have subtalar instability, you may have syndesmotic uh, medial instability, and of course, multidirectional instability. This is a case with a, uh, we are testing in a patient who is sitting, the anterior drawing test. And I think this is the most reliable test to suspect ankle instability. Of course, if you take a stress x-rays and it's wide open like this, or you have an anterior uh, drawer like this, like this one, it's pretty clear that it's unstable. But all the other measurements that has been described in the literature are not reliable. So. Uh, if you have more than five millimeters or 10 millimeters compared to the other side, whatever, this is not reliable. And even, even this, this instability is not absolutely reliable because some people have this uh, natural uh, flexibility, instability, hyperlaxity. And some of these patients, they have a very lax, a very unstable ankle and they don't have any symptoms at all. So you always need to compare with the contralateral side and consider the clinical pictures. We already saw this um, video before. I want to emphasize how an unstable chronic instability looks like. 
on the medial side and on the lateral side. The, the most common surgery that you will see in the literature for, um, for chronic ankle instability, and I learned it from my mentor uh, uh, who, with, with who I had the honor to do my fellowship, John Gould, and uh, is, has been published to have excellent results for most patients, except in long-term instability, hyperlaxity, recurrences, or patients with overweight. This is a video we made many years ago with the classical um, uh, suture. We, that's the fibula up there. We created uh, a space isolating the extensor, the superior extensor retinaculum. Then we open the capsule. You know, the anterior uh, talofibular ligament is just a thickening of the capsule. But if you move downwards, you see the perineal tendons and the uh, fibulocalcaneal ligament is, is a little bit thicker and stronger. We cut it. We typically uh, remove about five millimeters of the ligament. And then we used to suture this in a pants over vest or an overlapping, overlapping fashion. And once we did that, and the suture was done, then we sutured the uh, retinaculum over that, and this is how we tested that everything was stable. But since we began doing arthroscopy in most of our cases, because ankle instability was associated with osteochondral defect, with ankle impingements, and many other problems, uh, we started to think about how we could reconstruct the ligaments arthroscopically. And this paper that came out from Nicola Maffuli showed that you may repair just the tail of fibular ligament and not the calcaneo fibula, the calcaneo fibular ligament and achieve similar results with the classical brostom gould that typically achieve both ligaments. And then some people started to try like thermal shrinkage, like some people did in the, in the shoulder, but it didn't seem to work very well unless it was in Nick van Dijk's hands. Uh, un until Nuno from <laughs> Portugal, Portugal, he came up with a, with a technique that he was very honest enough to show 29% complications, but that co those complications were very mild and were, were transitory neuritis that eventually disappeared. So he's yeah, pretty good. So yeah, that technique yeah, uh, improved in, in different ways. And now we use this arthroscopic repair. Why do you want me to leave now? And then we pass the, the sutures through the uh, skin okay. in different ways. As you can see here, this video is, is accelerated. Okay. Of course, it's not at normal speed. And then you, you are able to uh, pass the sutures. And you can see how the ligaments and are brought down nicely into the fibula. Uh, this is a, a, a study that we performed with George Acevedo and uh, Paul Golano many years, a few years ago, actually. We did the arthroscopic technique and then uh, we uh, removed the skin. Paul, Paul actually did it. And then we tied the knot and we were able to show how the extensor retinaculum was nicely brought into the fibula. Yeah, with everything the is there, everything is there. We, we published the results of this study showing what was the safe area to I work. start the video now? And this is an x-ray that shows where the anchors typically are placed, uh, about five millimeters from the tip of the fibula and the second one at the level of the joint. Uh, we are now using a modified technique with the knotless, okay. um, knotless anchors uh, that we published uh, okay. last year in Foot and Ankle International. Uh, essentially, the, the main difference with this uh, technique is that we do ex everything exactly the same, uh, except for the fact that we do not perform a percutaneous incision uh, we do this, we pass the sutures distally, and then we use the same sutures to go back 
into the skin, then as you can see there, into the capsule, and then we're deep, and then we bring the suture lasso out of the portal, and we will bring the suture back again. So this is the suture that is coming from one anchor, the distal anchor, that once we passed the suture through the ligaments and the retinaculum, you can see how we can nicely bring the, the suture back into the portal. That's the second anchor, and we will do the same, and it's, it's well known by everyone. We use the suture lasso, and we bring the suture out of the skin, as you can see here. Right now, the suture is not gra grabbing any ligament, but then we put the suture in the suture lasso, and we go inside the capsule, inside the joint, come out out of the portal, and then we use this nitinol to bring the second suture out of the skin into the uh, lateral portal. So now we have the two sutures coming out of the skin, and the two other sutures that we have in each anchor are to pass the um, the, 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 the suture because it's, it's just like a shuttle. So the shuttle will bring the suture um, into, the, into the anchor and it will get tied by itself without the need of uh, using a knot. This is the way it works. So there is a suture and there is a shuttle. So the shuttle is just used to bring the suture in that gets uh, spontaneously trapped inside the anchor. So it's knotless, you don't need to make a knot. And we typically cross one suture into the other anchor, so we overlap more tissue. Um, another important thing that has recently come out is that when you perform this surgery, even if you can uh, do a, a a fast rehabilitation, you can make it faster if you add uh, an internal ligament augmentation, which is something like a tape that supplements your repair. So you have to do your repair open or arthroscopic, whatever you want. And then you put your uh, anchors with this uh, tape in the exact isokinetic position of the talofibular ligament. That's very important. It's actually paramount because if you over tighten this, you're going to end up with some restriction of the movement in the ankle. When you do this, uh, you actually have uh, something that is holding your ankle, but inside the ankle. This is uh, one patient that practices a lot of sports, but he's not an athlete. And you're going to see him two weeks after surgery with no uh, removable boot, no brace, and see how he's moving his ankle. We just removed the stitches two weeks after the surgery. And look how he's walking without any problem, even looking at his cell phones walking out of a hole without any problems two weeks out of the surgery. If you move into a more demanding patients, this is a professional soccer playing with a bilateral reconstruction of the ligament with augmentation. And look how he's doing at six weeks. Of course, he's about to go back into full practice of the sports, something there is no way you can achieve with a typical uh, reconstruction of the ligaments. This is another example of a hockey player from the Chilean hockey player, uh, women, female, female um, soccer team. Uh, she is seven weeks after the surgery with augmentation. And she is the one, you, you, you just need to trust me on this. She's the one who, who is going to score the goal. And she sent me the video to say thanks for the surgery. So this is completely different to what I learned. I actually learned from John Gould to use a cast for six weeks. And of course, everything you, you see in the literature is old fashioned in terms of rehab. Right now rehab can uh, be accelerated and improved and patients are much, much more satisfied. 
you can use and you can put your internal brace completely arthroscopically or you can use uh, use uh, the, the fixation, the augmentation with um, uh, percutaneous incision like in, incisions like in this case, you can do it whatever you want. To be honest, I have discussed this with many other surgeons and most of us really think that it doesn't make a big difference if you make a, a small incision or if you do it completely arthroscopically or percutaneously. To be honest, most of the time I do it on, uh, open. So my indication right now for internal ligament augmentation, uh, you need to have a tissue that is uh, yet that you can repair because if you do, do not have any tissue, the repair is not going to be done with this uh, technique. Uh, you, if you don't have any tissue to repair, you will probably need to add uh, a tendon graft or something like that. When we treat bilateral patients simul simultaneously, uh, and immobilization is not desired, we, we typically add this argumentation. We typically indicate the argumentation for athletes, so we do not use any kind of brace. We provide early rehabilitation and early return to sports and of course, a more satisfied patient. Uh, this is a very well-known uh, Argentinian soccer player he had uh, ankle impingements that were operated by my friend Jorge Batista from Boca Junior soccer team. I'm not gonna say his name, but you may recognize he was very famous, retired right now from professional soccer. But look what happened after a few ankle impingement arthroscopic surgeries. A lot of bone was removed anteriorly and the instability got worse. And I'm bringing this case up because we used to think that ankle impingement was something that was isolated. And the, the bone spurs, the osteophytes that were created around the ankle in soccer players were just coming from uh, stress in the area. But right now we think that these osteophytes, these bony impingements, are typically related to ankle instability. So the original problem is not the impingement, is not the soft tissue impingement or the bony impingement, is actually the instability. Uh, you may know the final situation. This, uh, this guy actually ended up with a fusion in one side and an ankle replacement on the other side. Was, there was no other solution for his severely arthritic ankle. So right now, we put a lot of attention to ankle instability. And I do trust my friend, Jordi Vega, uh, who published this article about micro instability. And what is micro instability? Is someone who has an ankle that under the stress test on physical examination is stable, but you probably have these two parts of the anterior talofibular ligaments and the superior portion of this ligament is torn. So the, the inferior portion still keeps the ankle very stable. And this is a picture that was done by Mickey Dalmau. And, and Mickey nicely showed that these patients have these two bandages of the same ligament and the inferior one is intact and the other one is the one that is torn. So right now, it, uh, this is one piece of information that has considerably changed my practice because right now it's very rare that I operate an ankle impingement and I do not treat the ankle instability. And the same thing happens with osteochondral defects. Curiously enough, I, I was uh, in a webinar, a similar webinar like this with Jordi Vega, and I asked Jordi, Jordi, have you seen any recurrences of your osteochondral defects now that you uh, do or perform uh, ligament repair in most of your patients? And he said, no, actually in the last couple of years in which I consider this micro instability and I perform surgery for the ankle instability in most of my patients, I have not seen any recurrences of osteochondral defects. So right now, uh, that concept has moved my practice into being much more aggressive 
in order to prevent what we realize right now that an ankle instability may produce, which is osteochondral defects, perineal tendon ruptures, ankle arthritis, and of course, discomfort, ankle pains, and a lot of problems. And this is uh, uh, the Jordi, one of Jordi Vega publications uh, in which this is his definition of micro instability, in which despite no uh, abnormal lateral laxity on physical examination, uh, the morphology of the anterior talofibrillar ligament has been observed on arthroscopic evaluation. Which abnormality? Uh, a tear of the superior portion of the ligament. So as a take home message, uh, I think chronic ankle instability treatment has changed over the, year, over, the, over the years. The diagnosis needs to be very accurate. You need to consider multidirectional instability, associated pathology, and you need to consider this concept of micro instability. For most of my patients, I would do a, an arthroscopic uh, ligament reconstructions and I would add uh, an internal ligament augmentation in some cases as the one I already discussed. And now I would stop sharing in order to leave my friend, Professor Meta, to continue with his talk. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Christian. It's wonderful. Good. Okay, good evening. I'm excited to be with you. Thank you for joining this um, seminar. And uh, thank you, Christian, for a wonderful uh, double lecture here, which has been very informative. Uh, today evening, uh, I'm going to take you through the conditions and uh, surgical uh, uh, operations uh, done for the big toe hallux and the lesser toe surgery and keeping it in uh, persons who are very active in sports. I'm going to take you through a few general conditions, which is one is hallux valgus which is a deformity at the big toe, hallux rigidus, which is an uh, arthritic condition, and uh, a turf toe injury, which is a sporting injury in contact sports, a Morton's neuroma, which is a nerve thickening in the front of the foot, and plantar plate injury, which occurs like the surf toe for the second and the third metatarsophalangeal joints, and common conditions in lesser toes. Without ado, we're going to take uh, start off with hallux valgus, what is hallux valgus? Hallux valgus is a medial prominence of the first metatarsal and a lateral deviation of the big toe towards the second and the third toe. What are the reasons? It's common in women. It runs in families, within the families. It is considered that wearing high heels is the cause, which is not the cause, which it is, there is a preponderance for the, for the uh, for the families. It is generally considered as a ligamentous laxity. It is seen in a little bit more in people who has a uh, flat foot and a tendency towards flat foot. Some of the adolescent uh, girls are uh, much more common to have it. How do these patients present? They present with pain around the mainly big, the big toe deformity around the medial prominence and sometimes pain on the lateral side where the other toe is giving some pressure. They can come with redness around the medial prominence or the redness around the second toe. Come with blisters and difficulty in wearing certain shoes. They had callosities on the top of the second toe and sometimes on the ball of the foot. They also complain of crowding of the toes and difficulty in wearing them. How do we examine them? Always examine them with shoes and without shoes. And always examine the foot while standing to start with, as the deformities and position of the toes changes while they're standing. Examine for the alignment, examine for the loss of middle longitudinal large, examine for the movements and the sensations of the toes. Always looks for the pulsations. Look at the range of movements of the first MTPHA and examine how much of the deformity is passively corrected in the examination room and how much of it is not able to be corrected. Always get some standing x-rays, which will increase the deformity. In the standing x-rays, look for the um, lines and look for the deformities. Mainly there are hallux valgus line, which is the uh, deviation of the big toe, 
and the intermeritosal angle, which is the deviation of the first ray when compared to the second ray. This is generally classified as mild, moderate, and severe, depending upon the number of uh, degrees. Initially, we start with uh, conservative measures in the form of shoe modifications, re reassurance of the patients, insole for arch supports. If there is any loss of middle large to large, always try to give a, a middle large support. A toe spacer can be used to be between the big toe and the second toe, but it, it usually takes up space in the shoes. Once the conservative measures fail, then we go into surgical management. Surgical management is usually a successful management in about 95% of the cases. The, there are various osteotomies uh, described in the literature, the common ones being a distal metatarsal osteotomy, which is a chevron osteotomy, which is used most commonly in uh, bunion surgery. This is used in mild to moderate, and this is also used in minimally invasive technique, which is called a MECA technique. A scarf osteotomy is used, which is a broader osteotomy, which is a metaphysial osteotomy, which is helpful in major deformities. If there is an instability at the base, then we use a basal osteotomy for very high intermetatarsal angle. Very rarely, if the, inter, uh, if the first TMT joint is very unstable, then we go for a lapidus fusion operation. A minimally invasive technique, which is a chevron osteotomy used by low speed, high torque purse. The advantages are very small skin incisions. The, bone, the skin complications are very less. They give cosmetic scars. The correction is as good as the, the open technique. The joint, what we have noticed is the movements of the joint postoperatively are much more quicker to attain. Recovery, the post op recovery, especially in sports people, is quick with uh, minimally invasive surgery. We advise two weeks of complete elevation and rest. In the four weeks, they can go into swimming to keep them active. We use a 4 deluxe heel weight wearing off loading shoe for six weeks. They go back to running, jogging at the 12 weeks, and contact sports once they are comfortable in jogging and running. The next one is Halex rigidus. Alex rigidus is a, usually a genetic condition, which is an arthritic condition of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. It is also associated quite commonly in men in who go in significant contact sports. It also occurs in multiple small traumas. How do they present? They present with pain around the big toe, especially after the activity. Difficulty in wearing shoes as the shoe becomes uh, very tight. They do get some amount of redness around the big swelling. They do get stiffness in the toe. Usually most patients don't complain of stiffness by the end of the stage as it is progressive very, very gradually. How do we examine? Clinical examination is important. There is quite swollen uh, big toe. Large osteophytes are seen. Uh, joint line tenderness is seen and a significant loss of movement are also observed. Usually x-rays are confirmative as, as seen on the screen, a normal x-ray, which is a good space around with no osteophyte and a large osteophyte in the AP and lateral leads. How do we approach the management of these patients? Initially, a good trial of orthotics are given, which is a rocker sole, which is offloading the front of the foot shoe modifications as uh, broad and wide and shoes with room around the first MTPJ is given. If for a short period of a couple of months, relief, if relief is necessary, a cortisone injection decreases the inflammation in the joint and gives relief. Finally, they will end up having two, two kinds of surgery. So if it is a early to early to moderate arthritis, and the pain is caused by the osteophytes, mainly in the dorsal side. An arthroscopic assisted chylectomy is done. Sometimes we use an arthroscope assisted along with the minimally invasive wedge burst to, re to remove the dorsum of the osteophytes in the metatarsal and the phalangeal region. If the arthritis is quite significant and the joint movements are very minimal, we go for a joint fusion where the rest of the cartilage is removed and is fixed with a couple of screws or a dorsal plate. The arthroscopic chylectomy 
this is this is the X-ray showing the pre-operative and post-operative microscopic phylactery. Recovery, usually elevation for two weeks for the wounds to settle down. Once the wounds are settled in four weeks, they can go into the swimming pool. We advise a Podulock shoe, a heel weight bearing shoe for six weeks to pack the fusion or the soft tissues and then go back into, if it is a chylectomy, they go back into full activities at the end of six weeks. If it is a fusion, it's about 12 weeks. What is a turf toe? Turf toe is an hyperextension injury which is happening in contact sports. If they are push off in the in a hyperextension mode for a long prolonged period or heavy landing on the front of the foot, they tend to get a hyperextension injury. It is called a turf toe. The the reason they, it's called a turf toe is when when the sports personnel move from grass or lawn surface to a newly newly laid turf the shoes the sports shoes did not slide and they had a lot of jamming of the big toes how do they present they present with swelling pain and bruise around the big toe they are they are unable to, to walk or jog and they cannot push off clinically they are very tender in the custom tpj mainly on the sesamoidal region usually an ultrasound scan is confirmative. X-rays are not usually helpful, but if, unless there is a significant rupture where there is a, a withdrawal of the sesamoidal region. Occasionally, we need to do an MRI scan to confirm the, the same. How do we treat them initially? If it is a mild or moderate uh, turf toe, it is treated with rise, elevation, compression, and analgesics. Given an offloading shoe, like a podulock shoe, like a post stop shoe, you can use a taping or like a toe spiker, either a sticky toe spiker or even a going to a lightweight uh, uh, Dyna cast. Very rarely in grade three or complete rupture of the uh, ligaments, we, we recommend an orthoscopic stroke open kind of uh, uh, repair for the top toe injury. Again, recovery. This is an this is a one injury where sports people take a very long time to go back into normal sporting. It is quite painful and debilitating. Again, post-op recovery is two weeks for the swelling to settle down, four weeks into the water, and almost twelve weeks when they start going back into jogging and contact sports. Uh, moving on to the lesser toes. One of the common conditions in the sports people is a nerve irritation in the front of the foot. This is caused by the thickening of the nerve, which is, uh, which is rubbing between the heads of the metatarsals and takes around the intermetatarsal ligament. There, there is a ligament called intermetatarsal ligament between the heads of the ligament and the nerve succumbs from the plantar side to the dorsal side where it gets irritated. It's usually much more common in closed shoes. Occasionally high heels can give rise to uh, irritation to the nerve. How do they present? They present with pain and swelling around the front of the foot. They, come, they usually complain of numbness in the adjacent parts of the toes. Occasionally they say there is a foreign body like a sensation or like a folded sock in the foot. Occasionally they give a clicking sensation when examining. There is not much to see in the in the foot, but there will be some fullness in the metatarsal, intermetatarsal space. And about 60% of the times you tend to get a mildness click, but not 100%. X-rays are not very informative. Ultrasound scan is confirmative. Occasionally we need to get a MRI scan. How do we treat these conditions? Initially a good trial of shoe modifications which is a wider shoe, which gives some more room to decrease the, the pressure from the metatarsal heads. A metatarsal bubble, like what it is shown on the screen, to elevate the third and fourth metatarsals. If the swelling is bad, you can do an injection in the, with a cortisone shot, which decreases the inflammation around the nerve. Finally, the final outcome is to excise the, the neuroma and send it for histopathology which is confirmatory. The surgical approach is either dorsal or plantar, which is the choice of the surgeon. 
and recovery is pretty quick in these kind of conditions. Two weeks elevation for the wounds to settle down. Once the wounds are settled, can go back into the swimming. Uh, body looks sure for two between two and four weeks back to normal walking from four weeks and jogging within six weeks. Plantar plate injury is, uh, is one of the newer diagnoses in the last 10 to 15 years. It is similar to turf toe or injury for the big toe. This is this cause this is more seen in the second toe and to some extent in the third toe. The usual reasons for the uh, turf uh, plantar plate injury is relatively long second metatarsal or a short first metatarsal. People wearing high heel shoes tend to uh, take more weight in the second and the third uh, uh, metatarsal phalangeal plane. Over the time, there is some attenuation in the plant, in the plant of plates. How do they present? Present with painful, swollen front of the foot, which is centered around the second and the third MTPJ. You can also see that it's a toe deviation to either one side medially or laterally. They have difficulty in push off. How do we treat? Usually it is diagnosed by ultrasound and a clinical tenderness and swelling around the second empty page. Front of plate ruptures are usually treated. Even an initial trial of uh, non-operative treatment is in the form of taping, as seen on the show in the picture, and a padded to offload the second metatarsal area. You can do a, for a significant cyanomatis, a cortisone injection is advised. If the way there is two deviation, either towards the sides or from, from the floor as it's a floating to a surgical repair is considered. Surgical repair is done by a special uh, kit. A metatarsal osteotomy is done in the, far, in the form of Wiles osteotomy and using a lasso method, uh, plant plate repair is uh, done. Recovery is usually about six to 12 weeks. Um, complete rest for two weeks and uh, gradual walking after six weeks. Finally, coming to the toe deformities, we can generally consider we explain about three deformities depending upon where the deformities are happening. A malar toe is a deformity of the distal interphalangeal joint where there is a 90 degree a flexion. Usually this causes uh, rubbing and callosities and redness and pain in the toes it shoots. A hammer toe is a deformity at the proximal interphalangeal joint where the flexion is uh, at, the, at the PIPJ and an extension at the DIPJ. Claw toe is a, a deformity at the a hyperextension at the metatarsophalangeal joint and a flexion at the DIPJ and PIPJ. These are pretty easy to diagnose on uh, um, clinical examination to check which, uh, which joints are in, in X-rays are usually not informative. Treatment again is non-operative treatment, which uh, is giving a, a good shoe box, a wide shoe box. Uh, if the non-operative treatment fails, then we go for uh, fusion operations. In the mallet toe, a DAP joint fusion is done to straighten the toes. In the hammer toe, a PAP joint fusion is done to keep the toes uh, straight. In the claw toes, the first metatarsal joint is, first metatarsal phalangeal joint is released along with the extensor tendon and coupled with uh, PAP joint fusions. Minimally invasive surgery in these kind of uh, circumstances is quite helpful. We use the low speed cutting burst. Small incisions are made and the results are uh, good with early function and back to sports. Recovery is quite quick. Quick, uh, two weeks rest for the wounds to settle down, four weeks to offload the area and back to normal walking and jogging within eight weeks. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Thank you for, for your wonderful lecture. Uh, Thank you. I think it's, now that we, we are talking about fast recovery and quick return to sports, uh, I have found uh, myself recently talking with the uh, people who are related to sports um, talking about how much you can push your fusions into sports 
And by this, I mean that collecting people's experience, I have seen that tarsal metatarsal fusions like Lapidus rarely uh, provide any problems for the athletes. Um, Subtalar arthrodesis, uh, even though people can run and practice a lot of sports, uh, he, and I have seen, I, I remember that my friend James Calder from, from, from England told me that he has a couple of uh, soccer players with the subtalar fusions that are able to play. Um, if you go into Taylor Navicular Futures, that's impossible for a professional player. Uh, the other thing that is very interesting, now that you mentioned uh, fusion of the uh, tarsal metatarsal joint, I mean, future of, of the allux valgus or fusion of the allux, uh, we, I have a couple of soccer players, professional soccer <laughs> players. <laughs> that are able to play without any problems. So I would like to know your experience because these experiences are not easily to find, are not easy to find in the literature. So when you're facing the problem in your office and someone says, doctor, I have this level of activity. What if you fuse my big toe? Am I going to be able to run again? And then when you face the professional athlete, if you fuse my subtalar, if you fuse my toe, am I going to be able to go back to sports? I, I now that I'm telling you what my experience had been, I would love to hear your experience, Doctor Meda. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely by, uh, spot on, your Doctor Christian. Um, I would say, I mean, none of these, I shouldn't say none of these. A majority of these fusions don't go into very high level competitive sports, but they go back into sports like oh, hell and uh, and evening, evening football or weekend football or within the within the local community fit football. I've seen first metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint people quite happily going well going into regular sport regular sports. Midfoot, as you rightly said, midfoot seems to be very very slow. Uh, whenever we do talar navicular fusions, it not only fuses, stiffens the midfoot, it also stiffens the hind foot indirectly around the subtalar joint and it kind of lack of that subtalar joint movement along with the midfoot movement seems to be debilitating for them. Mm. We have even seen the ankle fusions going back into football after, uh, after almost a year to 18 months. It's all to do with the, with the sports uh, sport mentality. The person who is very keyed up and ready to wanting to go into the sports always tend to find a way to go and help themselves by playing playing general general sports so i i think this is this is very important because the improvements we have seen recently with technology and the way we perform surgeries has more or less changed our surgical indications i um when was this two days ago or yesterday, I forgot. I was with my Brazilian friends uh, who asked me to speak about tendinopathies. Are we too conservative? So that made me think that I have seen my American friends. I remember Bob Anderson uh, recommending for uh, Jones fractures, putting the screw in and allowing the, the athlete to go back to professional football next day. And that's an amazing and it is very aggressive way of treatment and a very aggressive post-op protocol. And what they say is, okay, we want this athlete to go back because he's very important for the, for the team. And we know what they mean by very important. They mean money. And it's not a medical decision, it's a, it's a mix in the medical decision. I was recently involved uh, with a discussion about uh, someone who has an os trigonum. It's a professional soccer player that was about to be hired by another professional soccer team in Europe. 
And uh, the doctors from that team claim that this abnormality uh, would always <laughs> need a surgery and that's, that soccer player would not return to, to play. And those uh, experience, experiences, they made me think that run, right now is the other way around. Uh, most of the, I mean, take a look, Cristiano Ronaldo got a surgery of an, of an osteochondral defect and he's back to play. And we can think about many, many athletes who are back in sports after surgeries. So right now, surgeries do not prevent athletes to go back to sports. It's more the, the other way around. Uh, yes. There is a Chilean soccer player, Alexis Sanchez, that now play for the Inter uh, in Milan. And he, I, I know him very well because I, I also work for a soccer team and I work with him. And uh, he had several ankle injuries, like four in a year, in a row. Like three years, he had four or five ankle sprains. And what happened at the end? He ended up with perineal tendon ruptures. So those are the cases that my friends from the States who have happened to have a very long, uh, uh, let's call that like a rest or interseason period. So they, they pick up those athletes and they say, okay, this athlete is losing too many games. He has an ankle instability that would probably not need surgery if he, were, if he was me. But this athlete is going to keep on losing games, so we better do a prophylactic ankle instability surgery. So it's very, I don't know if you agree with me, so my, my final comments uh, is going to end up with your opinion. I think that right now that we can offer much better treatments with high chances of recovery, quicker recovery times, that we are more aggressive indicating surgeries for ankle instability, fractures, um, for tendinopathies, and many other foot and ankle problems, uh, even in a prophylactic way. I, I know that when we indicate a prophylactic surgery, we are very, very uh, near the limit and the end, uh, at the edge of the uh, uh, proper medical practice. So I would like to know your opinion and if you agree that we are indicating more and more surgeries in these professional athletes. Uh, I take your point. I mean, I think it is all to do with where we are trained. In UK, in general, the training has been very conservative. But but compared post, to the post. other side of the pond where you see Amsterdam or Berlin, where there is much more aggressive in the, in the arthroscopic uh, treatment. And North Americans seems to be a lot more aggressive in surgical management. And <laughs> I see the same pattern from the public itself. Um, the sports people are much more easier to con get convinced and happier to get a surgery done when you say, well, even if there is a 60 to 70% of chance, I will improve you. But if I go and take the same scenario and give it to my patient in Birmingham or London, they'll say, no, no, no not for me. I mean, uh, don't you think should we should be slow? But having said that, since 20 years, I've been in the foot and ankle. The treatments in the foot and ankle has become very dependable. It, there used to be a dilemma of, which, uh, of the treatment, which one to be the, which is the best and which is the best osteotomy, which is the best fusion. Now the, all the surgeries are done so to a very high standard and the results are very expectable by the end of, let it be three months or let it be six months. We know how the recovery is gonna be. That's how confident we are to get them back into normal activities to start with, back into, uh, into their shoes and back into the sports. And we know that they can go into the limits. 
And as you rightly said, one small injury seems to be over the time take over and get further associated injuries, like a simple ankle impingement will lead to simple ankle instability will lead to impingement that will lead to a tendon peroneal tendinopathy, uh, including uh, towards the HLS tendinopathy. If we have treated the first initiative, uh, initial, yes, sir. If you treat the initial cause to, with surgical or appropriate to full treatment, which seems to be a surgical management, then the outcome is very good and we are stopping multiple small problems in the future. Hope that that uh, helps. Thank you. I think we, we made a point. So, Thank Tiago. You. Thank you, Dr. Christian. Yeah, well, I think if the range of motion of a particular joint is a larger, by fusing it, the disability, is it more? Yes, we do agree that if the, if the movements of a particular joint, for example, an ankle joint, which is very mobile in one direction, or a MTPJ, which is very mobile in one direction, once we fuse, there is a significant amount of uh, uh, inability or disability. Uh, and if it is a talonavicular fusion or a midfoot fusion, the apparent loss of movements are very minimal. Uh, that is the reason when there is a, in, a large range of motion in a particular joint, a joint replacement is designed like the ankle replacement or the MTPG replacement. Even though the MTPG replacement is still in the infancy and we don't recommend at this stage uh, for majority of the uh, patients. An ankle replacement in the correct patient, in the correct age and correct activity patient does extremely well. I think uh, you need to be very careful um, with general recommendations because you, for instance, if you go to the extreme about the lapidus fixation, that seems to be uh, very safe in terms that it doesn't restrict uh, a lot of motion of the foot. But I, I have seen a few patients that do complain of, of that loss of motion. Um, I, I, even, I have even seen patients who are soccer players and who use the first toe a lot. When you uh, happen to cut or remove the flexorologist longus, some of them do not complain at all and some of them have severe complaints. The same thing seems to happen with the Achilles tendon rupture repair. When you end up with the mild uh, over lengthening after surgery, some athletes do not seem to complain and some people are not even able to go down the stairs. So uh, I, I would not like to make a, a general recommendation. Uh, I would advise you to consider uh, the options of surgery for patients who need it, but I would not recommend to over-indicate surgeries at all because we have seen, we have all seen, I guess, most of the people who are listening to this uh, webinar, we have all seen severe complications, people complaining that after whatever, even a hammer toe surgery that seems to be so simple, they, they are miserable after the surgeries. So uh, I would never recommend over-indicating surgeries, but I would advise to consider any particular case uh, specifically. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that over the years, we are moving more and more into indicating more surgeries. We have, because we have more tools, more techniques, more experience and uh, we get better results. Okay, I, th I think uh, we should, let me see if there is one more question. I don't think so. So uh, Dr. Christian, Dr. Capé and all the audience, thank you very much for your time. I think it was a wonderful uh, lectures. I think everybody enjoy it. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye, goodbye.